get right here in front of the folk. I know you. I know you. I know you. I knew you were going to do it. That's all right, Joe. You know, you know. If, if, if uh, the preacher uh, is like this, I tell you what, the anointing doesn't leave because you're at the club. The anointing rests over you. I'm anointed in the club, and I'm anointed on the parking lot. I'm anointed when I walk through the door. Come on, say amen, somebody. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And I want you to know something. I echo my sister over here who says I have a thank you. Thank you. Thank you in my spirit this morning. I want you to know the Bible says that in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What is his will? His will is for everything you're going through to say thank you. No matter what it is to say thank you. If it feels good, say thank you. If it doesn't feel so good, say thank you. When you have money in your pocket, say thank you. When you don't have any money in your pocket, say thank you. When your children acting up, say thank you. When your children are not acting up, say thank you. Amen, because he's still good. No matter what you're going through, he's still good. And he's worthy to be praised. That song just resonated within my spirit because it says, in his arms, I feel protected. Where can you go today and feel total protection? Where can you go today and feel like you are just safe from everything that's going on around you? Oh, my God. In his arms, I feel protected. In his arms, I'm never, never neglected, never disrespected. In his arms. I tell you what, he's a good God this morning. And you can say what you want to say, but he's worthy to be praised. And I give him the glory this morning. I tell you what, I thank him this morning. I thank him because he's so, so very good to me. So good to me. I praise God because the things that I have, I don't deserve it. You know, we walk around and we talk about what we deserve. I don't deserve it. But he's so gracious. He's so merciful. He's so merciful. Amen. And I thank God for it this morning. And I recognize this morning he didn't have to do any of it. But he did. Amen. And so when he does it, the proper response is thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, sometimes when people give us things, we want to say, oh, you don't, you don't have to. You shouldn't have. You shouldn't have. Well, now God knows that, yes. you know, but he does it because of who he is. Yes. Amen, amen, amen. And so I just thank him this morning. Yes. Praise God. Praise yes. God. I'm just so excited this morning and, and so just so excited about the word and so excited about coming together with my family, seeing you here uh, this morning, it's just good when we can come together. Isn't that right? Yeah. Amen. And so we're just so excited, and we just praise God for where he has brought us and, and what he's bringing us through. Yeah. You know, we, we don't know what we have to face, but he knows. He knows, and he knows how to maneuver and navigate and take us on through it so that we'll come out even better on the other side. And I thank God for that this morning. And so we're in the study of Judges. So turn with me, please, to Judges. Go with me, please, to Judges, the 11th chapter, as we uh, were finishing up last, uh, we were finishing up last Sunday, we started talking about the story of Jephthah, the story of Jephthah. So we come to a period now where uh, Israel is in a period where uh, they are just totally not grateful. They have a lack of gratitude. They have a lack of humility, and that's a, that's a horrible combination, a horrible combination. You have to find someone who's not grateful and someone who's not humble. You don't want to be around them. You need to run the other way, run the other way. So uh, no humility, no gratitude, and then they didn't have any proper leadership. So they were in a bad, bad way, and they needed someone to stand up for them. Now, Israel had a habit of always getting themselves into trouble and then crying to the Lord to deliver them. And because God was so merciful, is so merciful, God would hear them. He wouldn't turn a deaf ear to them. Now, he might say it, you know, in his, in his hurt, in his hurting, he would say, you know what? You just go cry out to the gods that you've been crying out to and see if they'll deliver you. 
you know, I'm just going to turn my back on you. I'm just, I don't want to have nothing else to do with you. But he was always turned right back to them because they were his people. And he just loved them that much. And so they needed someone to stand up for them. They needed someone to stand up for them. And we find out now that uh, in uh, Judges, the 11th chapter, Jephthah is the one that's going to stand up for them. Jephthah had had a lot going on for him in that the Bible says he was a mighty man of valor. He was a mighty man of valor. In other words, Jephthah had some fighting sense about him. Uh, he, had, uh, he had some uh, army sense about him. He knew how to rally the troops and get the troops together to do what they needed to do. But uh, there was another thing that Jephthah had against him according to the people. And you know that a lot of times, people will qualify you based upon what they see. Amen. They'll qualify you based upon where you came from. Amen. That's unfortunate, but it's a true thing. And we need to, you know, we need to be aware of that. And a lot of times we have to tell our children, honey, watch it. You know, people, people will just, you know, they'll put a sign on you. They'll put a label on you. They'll call you out just because of where you came from. It might not have anything to do with your ability. But because of what they see, they put a label on you. We have to caution our children to just be aware and look out for that. Because you have to work past people's stereotypes. You have to work past the labels that people put on you. And so Jephthah, even though he was halfway in with the people because his father was a Jew, he had a mother who was a harlot. How many of you know that it means something where you came from? But God can take all of that. God can take all of that and God can work it all together for your good. So it really doesn't matter where you came from because God can take that and work it all out for his good pleasure. I thank God for that this morning because if I had been disqualified from where I came from, I wouldn't be standing up here today. Praise God. I'm so glad he looked past all of that for me. Amen. Amen. All of my shortcomings and all of my, my down sittings, he looked past all of that. Praise the Lord. So Jephthah, his daddy was a Jew, but his mother, his mother was a harlot. Yes. And so it's something now, you know, you're around the people and you can't help what your daddy did. You can't help where your daddy went. You can't help what your daddy did. But then his brothers, his brothers who were whole brothers, we would consider, you would consider Jephthah a half brother. Uh, when, when, when they began to grow up, they thrust him out. And I'll tell you something now. It's something, they said this. Look, look at uh, Judges, the 11th chapter, and verse 2. And Gilead's wife, which is Jephthah's father, bare him sons. And his wife's sons grew up. And they thrust out Jephthah. And said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Now let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You can talk about me all you want to. But don't you talk about my mom. Don't you talk about my mom. Come on, you said that too, haven't you? Oh, you right now, if somebody says something about your mama, and some of us have mamas dead and in their graves, but if somebody says something about their ma uh, mama, honey, don't fighting words. No, you don't talk about my mama. You leave her out of this, because she ain't got nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. And you know, I, we, we go home and say something, we get into a fight, and we go home all clothes, all tore up, and everything all blooded up. And mama, what, what's wrong with you, mama? They were talking about you. They were talking about, boy, they don't know me. You, <laughs> you know? They don't know me. You just keep on doing what you're doing. But uh-uh, those fighting words. So they talked about his mama, and they thrust him out. So he experienced rejection. And we talked last Sunday about how rejection is a horrible thing for us to deal with. 
Now, Vivian, we go through every day of our lives. We reject something every day of our lives. If it's nothing but somebody we don't want to talk to on the phone, when we look down there and see their number, we say, I don't want to talk to them. So we reject that. We reject something all the time. But when it comes down to us being rejected, we can't take it. We can't take it. We can't take it. It's some pain and rejection. It's some embarrassment and rejection. It's some humiliation and rejection. And it's just, it just does not feel good. And so they rejected him. And when they rejected him, he fled and dwelt in the land of Tob. He left his father's territory and he went to the land of Tob. And then he had uh, some other people that he had gathered up under him. Some other people who had the same adventurous spirit that he did. And so Jephthah now is in the land of Job, and, and, and now you have the children of Israel and you have the children of Ammon who have come up against them to fight against them. Uh, and the Bible says in Judges 11 chapter and the fourth verse, are you there? And it came to pass in process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch who? Jephthah out of the land of Tob. Now why? Because see, we already established that he was a mighty man of valor. In other words, he was, he was courageous. He had some courage that they didn't have. But now his mama was a harlot. But now he had something that they needed. He had courage. And they did. He had strength. And they did. And so they had to go to the one that they rejected. They had to go to the one that they thrust out. And my friends, let me tell you, a lot of times that's how it happens. You have to help the very one that put their foot on your neck. You have to help the very one who told you that they didn't need you. But that's when you had to give them a pass, Pastor. To swallow that pride. Like, you know what? I'm going to help you this time. <laughs> because God, God made it so that I could do that. And so they went to Jephthah and they said unto Jephthah in verse 6, Come and be our captain that we may fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Did not she hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now when ye are in distress? Amen. Why are you coming to me now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, look, look, this is just like, and I said to you, go to uh, Judges, the 10th chapter, and look at what Jesus said to him. Is it Je Jephthah and Jesus are like, you know, they, they talk in the same kind of way here. In Judges, the 10th chapter, and look at verse 13 and 14. Now they're in trouble here. So they're crying out to the Lord, doing what they shouldn't have been doing. And this is what God said. He said, I've delivered you all this time from all these nations, but you persist to continue serving those gods. In verse 14, he says, go and cry unto the gods which you've chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulations. Isn't that just like what Jephthah's saying now? Uh, you didn't want me, but now here you coming to me to help you? And so we're, we're, we're looking at, at Jephthah and we're looking at now you make a decision. Are you going to be bitter or are you going to be better? Are you going to be bitter or are you going to be better? Sometimes God has done me like that. I cried out, God, oh, I'm, I, I want out of this. Mm -hmm. And God said, no, I'm going to let you stay down here long enough because yeah. you, you keep yeah. going back to the same. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Thank you, Pastor Bland. 
Thank you, Pastor Bland. And so now he says here, I'm in chapter 11, and I'm in verse 8. And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, therefore we turn again to thee now. So they had to exercise a little bit of humility. Because obviously they had participated when the sons uh, uh, sent him out. They didn't say, don't y'all do that. You know, a lot of times people standing by that can come to your rescue, but they won't come to your rescue. For whatever reason, it could be that they have fear of rejection themselves. They, want to be, they don't want to be excluded. They don't want to be ostracized. So they see you struggling. They see you going down for the last breath, but they won't come to help you. And so they knew what the sons were doing. They didn't do it out. Uh, they didn't do it uh, behind closed doors. They did it out in the open. And they allowed them to do it. And so they said, now, uh, uh, we, we need your help. We need your help. Yes, yes, yes. Lady you said something that uh, struck me. I remember uh, my mother telling me that you leave here and don't come back until you do something for yourself. All right. All right. All right. Reason why. Yes. I knew without a shadow of a doubt if I don't turn from my wicked ways Thank now, you, Lord. Thank you. if I don't turn, yeah. Yeah. then she and God gonna let me go. All right, all right. And you know, from then on, I've been doing what I'm supposed to do and been doing it the right way. But as long as she came, you know, when everybody else turned it back on you, that mother's love stick with you. They don't want to see us going down the wrong road. But when she turned her back, then and only then was I able to see the truth. Amen. And I thank God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Sister Shirley. There are some things, I tell you what, that you're going to get some information. You're going to learn. You're going to learn. One or two ways. And you know, hopefully you would learn from somebody telling you about it. But there's some lessons you're just going to have to learn the hard way. You're going to have to put your hand in the fire and find out that it's hot for yourself. And sometimes you have to keep putting your hand in the fire. Sometimes you have to keep putting your hand in the fire. Keep getting burned until finally it comes through to you. This is fire. And when I put my hand on there, I will get burned. Praise the Lord. And so I thank God for it. Thank God for those comments. Thank you so much. And so Jephthah listened to him. He gave him a pass. He gave him a pass. He listened to him. He listened to him and uh, made sure that their offer was valid. Mother Helen? Lady Deborah. Yes. My grandmother used to tell us we bought this sense. See, when you get, get yourself in hot water, just you bought that and you will never forget it. That's right. That, that sense that you, you're going you're gonna to remember that. You are going to remember that. Anybody else? Anybody else? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so, um, you know, we're all about giving, giving people passes because you can't do, you can't render evil for evil. Amen. You can't. That's no way to live your life. When somebody does an, uh, 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 evil to you, you turn around and do evil to them. That's no way. That's a miserable life. That's a miserable life. You'll never be happy. But it, it's more fulfilling, and, and, and you, you, grow, you, start, you begin to grow when someone can do you wrong, and you can turn around and say, you know what? I give you a pass on that one. I give you a pass on that one because there's, there's going to come a time that, that you're going to need some mercy. You're going to need some mercy, and so you ought to want someone to give a pass to you. Amen? Amen. Sister Vivian, Pastor Bland. You, you know Jesus says 70. <laughs> Sister Vivian, as many as it take. And many as it take, you know. And so that's, that's the life of a Christian. Now, you're not a doormat for anybody. But I tell you what, you feel so much better when you can just look at them and say, you know what, I pity the fool. And keep it moving. Just keep it moving. So just as many as it takes. Well, 
I'm, what I'm learning is, is that when I give a person a pass, Vivian, it's not so much for them as it is for mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. Because God called me to be free. Mm -hmm. And whenever I got a resentment, whenever I hold a resentment, whenever I see you, that thing just rises. I could be having a good time. I'm in a crowd and I see you and all of a sudden my whole mood will change or whatever. So that, that person, they might not even be thinking about me. So it's not them. It's me. Yes, yes. What am I going to allow to guide my life? Me, myself? I, this is supposed to be dead. I'm supposed to be gone through the cross, and I'm no longer me. But it's the spirit that's supposed to be yeah, lead, leading yeah. me. And a spiritual life <clears throat> is a happy life. It's a joyous life. It's a, uh, uh, a useful life. And I can't be any use to other folks if I'm walking around hating and, and, and full of resentments and everything. And so when I understand that it ain't about them, you see what I'm saying? That's that other life where I got to show you who I am and I ain't no punk. You ain't going to run over me. You ain't gonna, that's, that's that other life right there. That's on the other side of the cross. But on, the other, on this side, I'm resurrected as a new creature. That's what I'm learning. Yeah, amen. And I mean, and you know, and the fact that the matter is you have to keep that in the back of your head, actually in the front of your head. You know, that's this new life I'm living. But you know, if you uh, help people and then you keep getting beat over the head and you keep trying to help them, and how, how do you deal with now, that? Now, 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 you know, that's, some of that is a different story. Because at some point now, if you're helping and you see they don't want your help, or they misusing you? You just got to that, you got to you got to do something that's, different. That's a horse of a different yeah, color. Yeah, that's there. totally different. Totally different. That's a horse of a different color. Totally I don't, different. I you know I don't owe you anything. Yeah, yeah. I that's don't owe totally different. I don't owe you anything, and so I don't have to keep running and I keep doing this and keep doing that. You know, money that's in my pocket, I always remember it's my money. Yes, it's my money, and I go in my pocket and give it, brother Davis, when I get ready. Not because you manipulate me or not because you try to, you know, give this sad story or whatever. And that's being led by the Spirit, too. Because if you're not a good steward of what God gives you, you'll, you'll find out. Get broke. It wasn't on Isaiah. It was Bob Womack that talked about it. <laughs> Bob Womack said, nobody wants you. And so, and so Sister Vivian, that, Hold you... up. Let me finish it right oh, here. okay. It was Edgar Bland that told me. <laughs> when I got on crack... I'll never forget, he got me in the yard, he talked to me. My dad didn't said too much, but he said, son, you ain't got no money, you ain't gonna be able to hold on to that woman. <laughs> I looked at him like he crazy. I said, you don't know Deborah love me and everything. Son, you ain't got no money, you ain't gonna be able to hold on. I never forgot it, he wasn't lying either. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth right now. Glory to God, hallelujah. Hey, hey, thank you, Chief. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the truth. Hey, man, it'll free you, brother. Come on. That's right. It ain't only a clean up woman, it's a clean up man. <laughs> what, what, what? You better take a tip. <laughs> Somebody want <laughs> Sister Shirley, Sister Shirley. <laughs> I just want to say sometimes it's not the people, it's me. See, we have to learn to quit being a rescuer. It ain't always that God calls us to rescue other people when we see that they're not going the right way. And what we learn is that you have to let them go and let God and pray for them because some of us are sicker than others. And when you feel that you are being used, you got sense enough to cut it off. Yeah. Yeah. You have to make yeah. a decision what you want to do. Yeah. And then when you make that decision, you have to stand firm on it. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So, so, so totally a horse of a different color because you teach people how to treat you. And if you keep going back and they, they, they see, well, they, they must think that you are, she must be a glutton for punishment. So she keep coming back to get what I'm dishing out. So you have to make up in your mind that I'm going to do something different. I'm not going to let you, you know, you, you can't treat me any kind of way. Uh-uh. You can't teach y'all because I'm God's child. Come on now. Uh-uh. No. So you turn and you do something different with that. Amen. What you said, Pastor? All right. Amen. I want to have some sense at some point. 
Amen. Amen. And believe, believe me, you, they will do it. Those type of people know how to go from person to person. They do. They do. So when they leave you, they'll go right to somebody else. And, and you know, you, they, they won't feel bad about it either. And so uh, Jephthah now, they, they are uh, at a point where they're coming and they're kind of, you know, they're eating crow and they're kind of begging because they need some help. Because no one likes to be uh, in submission to someone else, when they, especially when they don't have to. So uh, they are under the, the control of, of the Ammonites. They're at their mercy. And so now they want someone to come because they're tired. They're tired and they want to experience the freedom that God intended for them to experience. But let me tell you something again. When you keep doing what you want to do, when you're not submitting to what God has said and what God wants you to do, now what, what else do you expect? What else do you expect? And so they had promised the person that would lead them, that they would make them head over all of the inhabitants of Gilead. And so look at verse 9. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, now isn't that funny? He said, shall I be your head? Remember now, my mother is a harlot. Shall I be your head? Uh-huh. And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, the Lord be witness between us if we do not so according to thy words. They needed him. They needed him. And so they were willing to do, they were willing to do what they had to do. Then Jephthah went uh, with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words between the Lord in Mizpah. And Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What have thou to do with me, that thou art come against me to fight in my land? And so... Um, when we look at this, we started at verse 12. When you look at this, then you can surmise a couple of things about Jephthah as you are uh, looking, as you are looking at the scriptures. A uh, first thing you can surmise is that he knew the scriptures. Because when we go through uh, verses 12 through 28, he's going to reference back to his history. And we always say that it's a good thing to have and know your history. Right. It's a good thing to know where you came from. So Jephthah had some foundation that he could go to the Ammonites and he could say that what you're talking about, you don't really know what you're talking about because I have history here and I know where we came from. Not only that, but he was not a, 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 a hothead. Jephthah wasn't a hothead. Not like the ones who thrust him out, the brothers who thrust him out. And uh, he wasn't looking for a fight. But now he was a man that if he, if he came up on a fight, that he would fight. That's like your pastor. Now, I still fight. I still fight. I fight if I have to. Now, you know, I am not looking for a fight. But if you bring one to me, you bring one to me, and it depends on what we're fighting about. Amen? It, it depends on what we're fighting about. And so uh, the king of Ammon declared that he and his men were only reclaiming the land. Let's look at the verse here. Let's look at verse 13. And the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt. From Arnon even unto uh, Jabbok and unto Jordan. Now, therefore, restore those lands again peacefully. And so, uh, if Israel will restore the land, then he said he would call off his troops. But Jephthah, uh, Jephthah knew his history. Amen. Jephthah knew his history. And he told him like this he, he presented the facts of the history. Now, you can't dispute facts. You cannot dispute facts. In other words, Jephthah began to tell them, he said, Moses had asked for safe passage through this land when he was coming up out of Egypt. But you refuse. You refuse. And because you refuse, we had to fight. And in the fight, God gave us the victory. This is like, you talking about your land. Come on now. This is not your land. And Jephthah sent messages again unto the king of the children of Ammon 
and said unto him, Thus said Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent. And Israel abode in Kadesh. Israel abode in Kadesh. And so he told the history of how we tried to do this and we tried to do this peaceably, but you all wouldn't cooperate. You wouldn't cooperate. And so then war had to be declared and God allowed us to be victorious. But then he also had this argument that the Lord had given Israel the land. And when the Lord gives you something, it's yours. When the Lord gives you something, it's yours. And so now in, in, in verse 23, he says this. So now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed. You know what that means? He took it away from you and he gave it to me. He dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And shouldst thou possess it? Wilt not thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomever the Lord our God shall drive out from before thee, them will we possess. But then he had another argument, and his argument was that Israel had lived on the land for centuries. Israel had been there. Israel had been there. So now, why you just want to come up now and ask for the land? When we've been here all along and you hadn't said anything. And so uh, he had another argument. And that argument was that you weren't fighting against me. As so many times we do, we think we're fighting against flesh and blood. But he said, you're fighting against the Lord. And I want you to know something. When you're fighting against the Lord, that's a tough, tough battle to win. <laughs> You can't win. Look at verse 29. Go all the way down to verse uh, 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 29. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands. You see how he was given the Lord all of, he, he placed the Lord where he belonged. He played the Lord as the one who was leading the battle. If you give us the victory, Lord, the only way we can go in and be victorious is if you go in before us. The only way we can be victorious is if you fight this battle. We're just the vessels that you're using to go in to, to take care of this problem. And so the Ammonites weren't fighting against uh, Jephthah. They were fighting against the Lord. He says, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. And so uh, this was a vow that he made. And, you know, it was, it, it's a difficult thing here. Because when you make a vow, it's better to make a vow or better to not make a vow than to make one and break it. And so while going out to battle, he made that vow and, and uh, he said he was going to sacrifice whatever came out of his house. And God gave him the victory. And look at verse uh, 32. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them. And the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he smote them from Aurora, even till thou come to Mineth, even 20 cities and to the plains of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. But remember, he had made a vow. He had made a vow. And so now it is, not, it is unlikely 
that he sacrificed her because the Lord doesn't accept human sacrifices. Okay, so let's just let's get that straight. The Lord done, but that's what he said, isn't it? He said, I'll sacrifice whatever comes out to meet me. Because at that time, sometimes they would have the little sacrificial animals in the house. <laughs> and then, and when you know, it, it might have been likely in his mind that when he thought he was coming home, that a little lamb or something might come out of the house to meet him. But unfortunately, the first thing that came out of the house was his daughter. And so, since the Lord doesn't accept human sacrifice, what is more likely is that he gave his daughter to the Lord to serve in the uh, uh, to serve the in the tabernacle, just serve, and she, and she remained a virgin. And then for for a woman to to remain a virgin and not have children, you know that was a big thing back then. If you if you if you had any if you know any womanhood, any femininity, you wanted to get married and you wanted to have children just like everybody else. But she wasn't allowed to do that, and so that is a very the most likely thing that happened. And so um, when you look at when you look at Jephthah and you look at uh, the the victory the victory that he had, look at chapter twelve. Look at chapter twelve. So now we have the leaders of the tribe of Ephraim. You remember how Ephraim came out to Gideon? Do you remember that when they came out to Gideon after Gideon was victorious and they, they got angry with him and said, you should have had us to fight with you. Okay. You should have. Why didn't you call us? Well, I didn't call you because that wasn't what, what, what I was supposed to do. And so here they're coming back with the same thing. So they come to Jephthah, they wanted to share in the glory. Do you know people like that? Well, you go through and you do all the everything that you have to do in order to get to where you are. But then there are people that come in and want to share in the glory, didn't have nothing to do with it, but want to say, uh, you know, a lot of times we said that, let's see, I can go back, let's see, was it, it was Shaq's father, was Shaq's father who just, Shaq had blown up. Money maker, making money. Daddy hadn't been there, but then he got a contract. Daddy came out of nowhere. I'm just like looking at it now. Who are you? And what, what did you have to do with this whole process? There are people that want to share in the glory that didn't have nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. And Ephraim was like that for some reason or another. And so they gathered themselves together and went northward. I'm in verse uh, 1 of chapter 12. And said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passed thou over the fight against the children of Ammon and didn't call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. You ain't got nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with this. And when I saw that you delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon. I did what I had to do with the Lord's help. And so they wanted uh, to share in the victory, but they hadn't been too eager to risk their lives in the battle. And so uh, there you see that they threatened to burn Jephthah's house. And so uh, Jephthah reminded them of, of, of what they did or what they didn't do. And so um, during the 18 years that Ammon had oppressed, if you remember when we first began talking about this, we said that the Ammonites oppressed them for 18 years. And during that time, uh, nobody from Ephraim offered to come to their rescue. And so he had issued a call, but then they, they did not come to uh, heed the call that he issued. And so uh, look at uh, verse 4. Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Math Manassites. You know, just start playing a dozen. You know, people would just fight dirty, won't they? They'd have to fight any way they can to try to get you, won't they? And so you just have to kind of be on the lookout for the wilds of the devil. 
because that you know we, we we don't need to be ignorant concerning the wiles of the devil that that, that comes to throw you off it comes to distract you. It comes to make you, uh, to get you off of, of, of your purpose. But we can't let that distract us. And so um, here it says, and the Gileadites took the passage of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, art thou an Ephraimite? If he said, nay. Then said they unto him, Say now, Shebeleth. And he said, Shebeleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Mm -hmm. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. Mm -hmm. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. Better know what you're doing. You better know what you're doing. See, if they had just had... If they just had, look, <laughs> won't our mouth get us into trouble? Yes, won't our mouth get us into trouble? Yes, Lord. Lord Jesus, if, if there's anything, I could just say, like, Lord, help yes. me. Yes. I talk too much. <laughs> I talk too much. Yes. I do. I do. Lord knows I do. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to give you a pass. I'm gonna give you <laughs> and so uh, Jephthah judged Israel. I'm in verse 7. Jephthah judged Israel six years, then died. Uh, Jephthah, uh, the Gileadite, and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. And so then it, it tells you after him, then there was Isbon, El. El on and Abdon, who judged Israel. And I believe if you count up all of the times that they judged Israel along with Jephthah, that that's about 31 years uh, 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 among all of them of where they judged, um, where they judged Israel. And then you have Samson who comes on the scene. So the, the story of Samson starts in chapter 13, and I believe, I have about five minutes, and we can just start there and pick up here. Next, do I have that, that time? Do I have about five minutes? I don't know, we get 10 to Okay, so, uh, what, okay, I'll, I'll just start. I'll just start just one, well, I'll just make a little intro and then mm -hmm. pick up here next um, Sunday. And so, Samson, just, to, just by way of introduction, We've all heard the story of Samson. We've all, you know, seen it on, on TV, the, the uh, Hollywood uh, the, theatrical version of Samson. I'll tell you this. Uh, if you read, and you can do that for me this week, read Judges 13 through 16, because those chapters are devoted to the history of Samson. So read chapters 13 through 16. You will discover... When you read that Samson is a man of mystery, he's a man that's hard to understand. Mm -hmm. He's a man that was sent to deliver, but he couldn't deliver himself. Mm -hmm. He was a man who was a conqueror, but he couldn't conquer himself. Samson was a strong, strong man. But Samson didn't know when he was weak. Yeah, no, he didn't. So he's a man that's full of paradoxes. Yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a man that's full of contradictions. And so um, it's going to help. This, this, this is going to help all of us. It's going to help us. Because we're talking about Samson. But it's really, we can look at ourselves. And, and we can get some help from the story of Samson. You know, uh, our lives doesn't have to be a life filled with contradictions, you know. And so uh, we're going to see where he had some pitfalls and some things he, he probably could have avoided. But Samson loves Samson. Don't we love, don't we love ourselves, don't we? 
And so there are some things that we can learn from this story, and I'm excited to begin the study of Samson next Sunday. Give the Lord a hand and praise everybody. Yeah.